Hey guys, my name's Nick. I'm a Microsoft Certified Expert Administrator. I create a lot of content for MSPs. Today's video, I'm going to show you guys how to run PowerShell within Azure Functions. If you're not familiar with Azure Functions, there's Microsoft solution for service architecture in the cloud here that you can utilize. And I'll be covering some of the benefits to the MSP and then walking you through actually how to set this up and how to run scripts against all of your customer environments. Before I get into today's video though, if you do want to see content around Microsoft 365 in the MSP space, be sure to subscribe. So getting into it here, I wanted to quickly go through some of the benefits as in why would I go through the time of actually setting this up and what are the benefits of actually running PowerShell within this Azure function. So traditionally, I think we've all set up scheduled tasks on servers. We've been running that for a long time, but with the move of all of the architecture going into the cloud, many customers being solely in the cloud within Microsoft 365, we're going to need to shift the architecture of running scheduled tasks and PowerShell scripts within customer environments into this cloud-based environment. So with that, I think Azure Functions is going to be the future of that in a combination of running it via MDM like Intune, for instance. This architecture does allow you to run these PowerShell scripts against your customer environments and a timer in the sense of a scheduled job or an HTTP trigger, which could be run on demand. In the scope of this video, I'm not really going through that today, but I'll probably do it at a later time. In this video, we're gonna be covering the timer-based scripts. The cool part again is that you do get to run these scripts against all of your customer environments and you can do that in a very secure fashion with the secure application model, which I'll get into here as well. Some examples you guys probably will have more than, than I'm referencing here, obviously, but when you think about this as a solution, you need to be thinking, what should I or want to be doing in all my customer environments periodically in an automated fashion for enhanced administration and management of all my customers? Some of the examples I put up here are looking at all the mailboxes and making sure that the audit logs are enabled on all of those. We are periodically removing licenses from shared mailbox accounts. And I'll be showing you guys that here soon as a reference here. And then maybe another one is just simply updating documentation, like your documentation tool, like IT Globe. So taking things like the users and creating them as contacts or being able to derive licensing information periodically and, and run that as a job to update your documentation as well. These are all things that you can do within the Azure function environment. So some of the prerequisites here that I'll mention is that you do have to have an Azure AD subscription. You are spinning up resources within the Azure cloud. And as far as cost goes, I'll reference the calculator here and link that. If you're using the consumption-based model, then your costs are going to be nothing or next to nothing for what you're going to be doing and what I'm going to be showing you here. Proficiency in PowerShell, I think, is a must or else you're just going to have a very bad time. You could probably follow along with me step for step here and get what I create done. But to fully utilize the benefits of this, I think you need to be scripting yourself and you need to understand basic error handling and things like that because you won't be able to create anything more than what I show you at that extent if you don't know PowerShell that well. Lastly here, we have the secure app model secrets. And this is something that has been brought to light from Kelvin over at CyberDrain. I'm not actually going to be covering how you derive those secrets because he shows you this clearly in his content, which I'll link below. But essentially, it does allow you to create a headless connection with all of your customers. And when I say headless, I mean you just don't have to have a human involved to type in a username and password to connect. You're deriving tokens that can then be used and have refresh tokens with them for securely accessing and running scripts against your customer environments. So all those are things that I'll reference here when we get into the demo. And I'm actually going to do that now so you can just see visually, you know, how we're going to go about creating the Azure function and then showing you some of the basic scripts you could potentially run. Before I get into the actual demo here, I just want to reference the pricing real quick, just so everybody's aware. You have this consumption based model here, which you do and you can pay for whatever you use. It's the benefit again of a serverless architecture, so you don't have to spin up a server and have it running 24 seven and all of this to actually you know, do the things that we want to do from a scripting and a scheduled task standpoint. And they actually grant you 1 million executions for free per month. 
So again, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be paying much for this, if anything at all. You might be paying a little bit for the storage cost for insights and monitoring and things like that over time, but it's going to be very minimal. The, the cost that you accumulate are going to be very minimal in this, uh, this actual architecture. So I'm here within portal.azure.com within my own environment. And this is going to be you signing into your own Active Directory as an MSP. And here you can either start to search for fun function app here and it'll pull up, or if you're like me and you've created a lot already, you'll have it here as a tile. And this will take you to the page which shows you all your particular Azure functions that you've created in the past. But if you're new to this, you'll not have any here. In this particular sense, what we're going to do is define the subscription you want to apply this to that will already be in your account. You'll define the resource group you want to associate it with. You can create a brand new one if you want, or you can link it to an existing one. And if you want to go ahead and say a function app name here, you're going to make this unique. This has got to be unique for the actual service, but you can put it in a name here and they'll validate it for you in real time. For your runtime stack, you're going to choose PowerShell Core and it'll default to 7.0 and that's what you'll keep here. Your region should technically put it where you're closest. Otherwise, you can pick a region if it's associated with your resource group here as well for that particular piece. For the hosting, you can choose to go ahead and put it into a new storage account or associate it with a new storage account or associate it with an existing one within the tenant. If you're just doing this as a POC, highly recommend, again, just storing up an, a new one here for you. And then for the plan type, we're going to leave this defaulted to the consumption serverless plan. For monitoring, I typically just say that we don't want to enable application insights. You could if you really wanted to. I haven't felt the need to go and do this yet. I'm not a developer. I'm not in DevOps. I am using a combination of just PowerShell IC to debug plus being able to look at the logs here, which you'll see in a second when we run through the actual architecture. So don't need to do that. Click at review and create to actually create this and it'll validate that everything's okay. I can review one last time and I can click on create here. This will take just a few minutes to spin up and I'll be back when that's done. Okay, that took about a minute or so and now our deployment is complete. So we'll click on go to resource here, which will take us to our app. By default, there's no functions actually created in here. A couple of things we'll want to do here just for the scripts to work, and this is just from my experience and knowledge of testing this for many hours. You're going to want to come in here and actually go to general settings, and you're going to switch this to 64-bit. So allow you to run things like the MS Online modules and things like that within there without even getting any errors or anything like that. So we'll go ahead and save on this page. And then we'll wait for that to finish updating. We get the success message. We'll come back here to application settings. What we're going to do here is actually start adding the tokens and GUIDs from the secure application model that we derived from running that script with Kelvin. And again, his content is here and I'll link that below. But essentially, you know, he's showing you here how to derive and, and get these new uh, credentials and, and tokens from the, the model itself. So those are things that you need to follow. What you're doing here is simply going in and you're defining name value pairs. So you're taking the secrets that you derive from Kelvin's documentation and you're putting them in here as the actual environment settings that we're going to be referencing within the script as well. And this just allows you to not have to have that within the script itself. You can reference the environment variables and these are secured in this environment so that you don't have to necessarily write them out as plain text for all of your tokens that are actually like something that you want to keep very secure. So I'm going to go ahead and, and just add these here and I'll be right back when I'm done. Okay, I'm back here and I've added the particular GUIDs and secrets here. So I've got application ID, application secret, exchange refresh token, refresh token, tenant ID, and UPN. Those are all things that are the output of Kelvin's script there that he made and can be used for the headless authentication that we're going to need. So when I'm done, you got to be sure to click on save or else it'll just blow away all those changes you just made, but it would give you a warning. So there's some safeguards there in that. So make sure that that is saved correctly. 
And the next thing we're going to do is go to the app file section here and we're going to click on the drop down when it loads and we're going to go into the requirements folder. Requirements folder is also known and termed as dependencies within Azure Functions. So this allows you to define the particular uh, modules, I would say, that you want to include in your directory that will be constantly updated with any new updates. So they give you an example here with the AZ module and they say it equals version 5. Dot, and then the wildcard just simply means keep me up to date with any version history here that we have. So in this example, I'm going to just show you a couple. You can do the modules that you know of well, like Partner Center, for instance. So you got to use this particular syntax for it to recognize it. And then you're going to want to use the three dot asterisk here for Partner Center. This is on version three. And then another common one is MS Online. And you want to do that at one dot asterisk. And that's really it for that section. You can just save here. All right, so now we've kind of configured the back end pieces that we need to start testing a particular function. So in the functions, you get the ability to add a template, and the template defines like what type of a function it is. And they have multiple here. The most common you'll probably be working with is the timer. And I'll reference the trigger one earlier too, where you could call this actual function and script on demand. And maybe you also wanted to pass in some parameters too. So it's multifaceted in the sense that, hey, I could pass in a tenant ID and a user that this script could run against different customer tenants or something like that. That is something that's possible. As far as this connotation goes, this, this schedule, this is a cron notation, and I obviously am not an expert on that, so I reference Microsoft's documentation, which I'll pull up here now to show you and I'll link below. So within here, they give you some examples, and these you can just copy, like maybe you just want to do it every day or, or something like that every weekday or at a certain point in time. Obviously, you'll be cognizant of how it's going to affect the client, but this is something that you can use and modify for when you actually want this trigger to run. So for this one, I'm just gonna paste in 9.30 every day, just as an example, and we're just gonna call this the function test. And I'll click on add. So from here, you can go ahead and go into the code test section. And what we're going to do here is we're simply going to make sure that we install those modules first. I've seen some use cases where you have a whole script and it, and it needs to define and install those dependencies into the directory. And it causes some problems if you do not go ahead and install them first. So you have some basic boilerplate script here in the run PS1. What you're going to do is simply do this mod, import dash module and then MS online. And then specifically you're going to say use Windows PowerShell. This is critical that you add this extra parameter here or else it will not actually work. That is something else that I figured out through testing here. So when you click on the save button there, it pulls up the log that you can interact with. But we also just want to do this test run. I don't want to modify anything here with this and I'm not going to really cover the keys for right now just for the purpose of this demo. But this is going to say that a parameter that Name doesn't match MS online. So we need to figure out what's going on with that. And this is something that I put a dash in, which did not need a dash. So let's go ahead and clear that and click on save. And then try to click on run one more time here. So this connects and it's saying, hey, we loaded the module in this and it's done. So that's good. And I'm going to go ahead and do the next one now, which is Partner Center. And the same thing here, use Windows PowerShell, click on Save, and clear the logs here if you want, and then click on Run. So this is telling you that Partner Center is loaded and the MS Online module is loaded. So that's all we needed there. 
So those are things that you need to do just as prerequisites. In some cases, it'll tell you that it's the first managed dependency that's downloading and it'll take a few minutes. So you might see that message instead of what I just saw there. But uh, if you get a timeout error, it may be because you're trying to import too many modules at once and you may just need to do one at a time. That's something else I've actually gotten as well. So the next thing that we're going to do here is we're going to try to run a basic script, I guess, to connect to Partner Center and visually see my customers. So I'm going to grab this here and I'll, I'll paste this in there and it'll be linked in my documentation for you guys. But essentially here, I don't want that again. Well, what I've done here is we've defined our variables that you put as environment variables. And this is the syntax that actually calls those. So again, we don't have to put in the secrets within to our code. We're actually storing them in a safe way as environment variables and just calling them here into our code on demand when we actually hit runtime. And this code, what it's doing here is defining the variables for us, getting them as credentials, and we're actually connecting to the MSUL service across all of our customers via these tokens for the graph and Azure AD. And then what we're doing here is we're looping through all of our customers in Partner Center and we're simply saying, I found XYZ company name. And so you'll see like the number of customers we found and anything else as far as the, uh, the customers listed by name in here. You have to click save before you actually run this. Be sure to do that or else it'll just run this part again. And then when you're ready, you can click on run. This imports our modules here again. Every time I like to load those in just so it has it there and then it will go ahead and run our script. And these are gonna blur out just for privacy, but it found 17 customers in my partner center and it found all my company names here. So from here, you really set to start running various scripts. And from there, you know, you, you really can manipulate a lot of data or read a lot of data that you store in other locations like IT glue and things like that, which I'll show you in future videos. But some of the reasons you may get errors here, you may get an error about the module not being loaded. And that's because you didn't really install it the first time. So, you know, we just want to run those import, install dash modules or import dash modules i should say make sure they're listed as dependencies without any typos you may see certain errors about the permissions being off you don't have access to this account and i would first check your environment variables just to make sure that one you don't have any syntax errors here like a space in between these or maybe even in the environment variables that you put like a trailing white space at the end of the actual values of these, that's a common thing. One thing I also did originally, which I spent like an hour trying to figure out what was wrong with my code, is I did this and you know it's supposed to be a colon, so it wasn't returning the correct piece of the environment variable for me and was causing those errors. So definitely pay attention to that. But those are most of the things there. And, and from here, you know, you can start maybe utilizing some of Kelvin scripts as well that he keeps coming out with, but it really gives you some flexibility on looping through your customers and actually running scripts on demand. So as far as some final thoughts here that I wanna share just based off of my own learning is one, this is something where they're using PowerShell 7 in this environment, which is much newer than you're probably using locally. It's probably using 5.1 or something like that. And certain commandlets like the MS Online module, it's considered V1 whereas the Azure AD module is considered V2, and it's more compatible with PowerShell 7. So in some cases, I found that I couldn't dissect an object for properties with the MS Online module because of the fact that it wasn't supported anymore, and I had to use Azure AD instead, and you'll actually see that in my unlicensing of shared mailbox script. Secondly, you also may not even be able to use some of the commandlets from MS Online because it doesn't recognize them and won't use them in there. So just be aware of that. For debugging, I recommend if you're not using Visual Studio Code, which again, I'm not a developer, I'm not using Visual Studio Code, I'd still recommend using the IC to debug scripts in that environment first and then uploading them here and testing them out here afterwards as well, just to make sure you can properly debug a script. 
Um, I use write hosts a lot in these scripts originally. Like now I only have, you know, these two here for the demo purposes, but I'd like to use them against variables to make sure that it is actually able to read the output and I'm not passing in blank values. That was another thing that I learned uh, from this whole experience. So those are all insights I wanted to show for you guys today and show you the demo here of how to actually connect to MS Online and PowerShell command lines that you're familiar with. If you do have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Otherwise, like I mentioned earlier, be sure to subscribe if you want to see more content around Microsoft 365 and the MSP space.